Welcome everybody to this uh, webinar to discuss the, uh, um, the spatial framework uh, for the Oxford Cambridge ARC. Um, I'm delighted to have a fantastic panel today uh, to discuss this really interesting document and take us forward um, over the next few years to uh, the government's support to, to see growth across the Oxford Cambridge ARC um, and economic regeneration um, across the region. So a very exciting time for us all and a really good panel. So I'll introduce the panel first. Um, we have Chris Krasnowski, who's the portfolio director uh, for Oxford to Cambridge ARC unit in the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Uh, we have Robbie Owens, who's a partner of Pinsent Masons and Head of Infrastructure Planning and Government Affairs. Uh, Robbie has over 30 years experience of promoting and opposing a wide range of nationally significant and major transport and other infrastructure products uh, projects for public and private sector clients, including heavy and light rail, urban transit, roads, ports, harbours, aviation, etc. We have Bev Hindle, who's the Executive Director of the Oxford Cambridge ARC Leadership Group. Uh, Bev is the Executive Director of the Leadership Group, which represents the local authorities, LEPs and universities across the ARC. Um, we will have uh, Jackie Sadek, who's Chief Operating Officer of UK Regeneration. Jackie has a long and varied career in re regeneration and public service, including time at the London Docklands Development Corporation, Tesco's, CBRE, Kent Tameside, Park Royal Partnership, Bureau, and more. And we have Rob, Rob Hopwood, a partner at Bidwell's. Rob is a planner and Bidwell's ARC lead, having tracked the progress of the ARC uh, opportunity for more than 20 years. Um, we will start with uh, 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 an introduction from Chris and who is going to go talk through some slides before we open to a panel discussion. Um, we will be taking live questions um, from the audience as we progress through the, the webinar. Um, and Chris, uh, sorry, Chris, over to you for your uh, slides. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, please, everybody do answer the polls as they come up um, throughout the webinar as well. Uh, Chris, over to you. Brilliant. Th thanks, Ian, and, and thanks everyone for diving in today. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on sort of three uh, three areas uh, as part of the kind of spatial framework that we launched yesterday. The first, very much look, thinking about kind of how we, what, why we're doing what we're doing, and, and what the opportunity is for us. Secondly, I'll touch on some of the principles that are going to drive um, how we think about the spatial framework and what we develop over the coming sort of two years. Um, thirdly, I'll touch uh, on our kind of approach to engagement and how you others uh, across the art can really contribute to this and, and the kind of timeline that we're working to. And I, and I just wanted to kind of finish with some final thoughts on just, just why I think this is such a great opportunity and a really important milestone in, in kind of what comes next. So if I go to the, the, the first slide, please. Um, so, so yesterday, I hope, um, uh, and, and, and sort of given how many people are here today, I'm sure people have seen the sort of spatial framework that we launched, um, that was launched by Chris uh, Pincher, the Housing Minister. Um, and, and for us, this is a kind of really sort of uh, key moment in kind of where we take the, the arc on its journey in the future. And there's been lots of conversation uh, about this, you know, not, not least since 1995, uh, as, as Rob has been following since then, but, but also more recently through the NIC work and, and kind of different ways in which government has responded some of that and how kind of local businesses and local partners have engaged in in the conversation but yesterday marked the moment for us to take that next step and to really start to focus on what we can what we can achieve in the arc both today in the uk but also kind of how we can compete internationally and globally and it's our ambition to make sure that the the arc competes as one of those premier innovation and growth corridors uh, globally um, as part of uk plc so for us it's a massively important moment that the paper we launched yesterday is really an opportunity for us to work with communities and local partners to develop a plan that will kind of make the area a brilliant place to live, work and travel in, um, support lasting improvements to the environment with a really strong focus on how we think about green infrastructure, biodiversity, uh, natural capital, um, alongside the importance of the economy. And we see both of these pillars as being essential to kind of to interacting, to kind of make, make this the place that we want it to be uh, in the future. And then finally, we, we also want to kind of do this in a different way. So for many of you who would have seen previous reforms that we've done around the planning system and, and also yeah, over the past sort of uh, 20 years, 
years. What we really want to kind of bring to bear here is something that is not, not just open and transparent, but also digital to enable us to kind of reach into communities and groups that are perhaps outside of the system for, for engaging in kind of uh, shaping the future of a place. And so we're really keen to make sure that we maximize that. And, and most importantly, for us, this is about transformation. We have what is one of the most innovative, successful kind of economies in, in the UK on our doorstep, and we're not really kind of maximizing its opportunities. So we really want to think about not just uh, how we kind of support sectors to grow in, in a kind of really positive way, but also the way in which we engage and help them to kind of and support them to grow is a really important part for us. So th this project in government is seen as one of the one of the top priorities of the Prime Minister and also will be one of the uh, ways in which we can demonstrate a different way of working between government and place and we're keen to make that, that make that happen. So the next slide kind of really just touches on some of the kind of principles um, that are in the in, in, in the report that we've uh, that we launched yesterday and, and, and I think these are important because what they do is guide kind of how we take the next steps on this journey for the next two years and how we kind of interact as a, as a, as a kind of as a, as a group of colleagues and friends to kind of shape what comes next. Um, the first and most important is that we really want this to be collaborative. So we want to reach out to a whole range of people and take everybody's views and give you an opportunity to kind of help us shape kind of what we think is a, is a truly sort of great place and a, and a place that will be um, hugely successful in the years to come. Um, as I've said already, we want to make this digital. So, so for us, it's thinking about how we can engage digitally, how we can kind of develop an evidence base that we can then share digitally, um, and how we can make sure that there, there are different mechanisms for us to interact and kind of work on, so that as, as we go beyond the kind of the plan process and as we get uh, into sort of business as usual, there's a really great way in which we can collaborate and use the tools that you know have really come to the fore during the, uh, the pandemic uh, to enable us to kind of work together and collaborate. It's important that this is also adaptable, both in terms of acknowledging that we're in a, a huge period of change and there are lots of things that will happen over the coming weeks and months and years that we're, we're not kind of fully abreast of and we'll need to be able to kind of adapt to kind of fit with those, but also that any plan that is uh, steadfast in what it will achieve in 30 years time is not going to be a plan that's fit for purpose. So it's important that we we build in the kind of the capability um, as part of the DNA of the plan so that it can adapt to kind of changing circumstances, changing needs, the changing employment landscape um, as we go forward. Increasingly, uh, everyone talks about the, the need for kind of robust evidence and an evidence base that is uh, fit for purpose. And, and we want to make sure that that is the case here as well. We want to be driven by the evidence. We want to make sure that we're sharing the evidence and we want to make sure that people have you know, uh, looking at the same things that we're looking at and making decisions on as we go through this process. And we think that's really important for, for how we operate in the future. Um, ov obviously, it's kind of, you know, thinking about this from a uh, delivery time uh, perspective, the long run is really important to us. Uh, our, our own analysis tells us that if, if we focus too much on the short run, we end up missing some of the great opportunities of tomorrow. And so it's really important that we take that longer term view and start to put in place kind of plans, investments, ideas, strategy that kind of are looking to that broader long-term picture. Um, I sort of touched on the beginning around sustainability. For, for us, this is the kind of one of the cornerstones of, of this plan. The thing that will make this different to many others is, is the kind of focus that we're going to put on ensuring that we're delivering uh, a sustainable future uh, that, that we can be proud of tomorrow. And that will require us to kind of think very differently about how we how we work with people, how we make choices about what we invest in. And because for us, this is really about putting something on, on, on a footing that really enables us to, to meet the kind of challenges of climate change and, and to support lasting improvements to biodiversity and the natural environment and, and that has to be first and foremost in our minds as we make some of the choices that we make because we have to think about what what the arc will look like in 30 40 years time and, and for the for the people that will be living here tomorrow and that's really important um, Importantly, around integration, um, what this is, is a land use and transport plan. It's integrating those things so that we're thinking about um, the, the opportunity around the economy and how it's shaped over time and looking at that alongside how we think about transport planning and sustainable transport planning, as well as then where the right communities and homes should be uh, based on that. And, and we think by integrating in this way, we'll have a much better sense of what the kind of different trade-offs are and what the choices could be. And it will help us think, think through how, how kind of development sits in the landscape that 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 we have and we've inherited from 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 past generations. 
Um, I won't say too much about quality, but but it, it wouldn't be right not to say that quality remains at the forefront of our minds. You know, we're sitting in a, a massively important kind of global economy uh, in, in, in a sort of global race. And it's really important that that we're kind of creating the sorts of communities and the products and, and, and the infrastructure uh, that we build tomorrow that is fit for purpose for a, a modern, technically savvy uh, technologically savvy sort of society and, and so that's really important and we want to also live somewhere and, and interact with somewhere that's beautiful uh where design is sort of driving some of the choices that we're making which which remains in, in integrally important and then and then sort of the final two areas are really around sort of inclusivity and added value and i'll say a bit more about added value at, at, at the end but in essence on, on on inclusive we want to a make sure that people can engage in this and work with us and, and do so in a way that's transparent and open and that everyone has a voice and we're kind of really clear on um, how we respond to that but also that the arc is you know is has areas of um of deprivation and um and when when when, the, when we talk about leveling up in the country we also should be thinking about how we level up uh, across the arc and also how we make more of some of the assets that we have you know and i and, I, and i'm particularly kind of struck by um how much more we could do and the opportunity in the central part of the arc to really kind of transform uh, the arc long term that will be additional to what we would have done anyway so the the, the next slide just quickly captures um where we're going in terms of sort of process and so it's taken directly from um from the document uh published yesterday but, but in essence we're going to use the next kind of uh six months or so to really start to focus on the vision we'll be having some conversations sort of locally working across a range of partners and through round tables and other things um to develop what we think is a, is a kind of like a, a vision that's world leading and, and sort of representative and sensitive to the to the arc as a as a place and then we'll want to consult on that vision and, and, and consult extensively on that vision to make sure that all the groups in society that want to have a voice have, have shared that voice and we'll publish the findings of that consultation in a really accessible way so that we're really clear on what what we've picked up what we haven't but also so other people can see uh, the views uh, of, of the many that have responded. We'll use that vision to then form the basis for how we go about developing um, a spatial framework. And ordinarily we wouldn't do kind of uh, a, a sort of interim sort of milestone here, but we think it's really important to kind of demonstrate the kind of next steps along, along the journey. And to also give people a sense of how we've responded to the conversations we've had so far and give you a chance to kind of talk to us again. Once we publish that, we'll again consult on that extensively. Again, we think it's really important that people have a voice in, in, in this and we'll make sure that uh, ample time is built in to make sure it's a, that's a reality and that we respond to those. And then we'll, uh, towards the spring 22 and then onto the autumn, we'll start to develop what will be the, the full strategy and, and the full draft strategy that we want to kind of take and then adopt as the, as, as the plan for the area. And so, and then after that, obviously, we'll think about how we how we implement it. But importantly, this is this is a kind of rapid process. Um, it's less than two years, which which is kind of very quick. But we think it's important to signal that kind of that impetus to to the investor to, to investors. We think it's important to signal the impetus to kind of people that we're actually doing something and we're going to make some progress, rather than having uh, spent you know three or four years not doing enough. So, so for us, it's really important to get this done properly. We want to engage effectively uh, and we want you to be part of that process with us. And so just finally, just to finish, and I'm sort of conscious I'm probably overrunning, Ian, apologies. The final slide just captures kind of some of the things that I think make this different um, for, make it different for us, but also make it different for you and the people of the ARC. Firstly, you know, we will be pioneering and prioritizing the green ARC uh, as we go forward. And I've said a bit about that already, so I won't, I won't stress that too much more. The second element that we really want to focus on is kind of how we think about economic growth and the patterns of that growth, both in terms of scale, their trajectory, but also the sectoral trends that will come forward. And then how, how we express those spatially, I think, is really important. And it's something the planning system perhaps doesn't do as well as it might and something we want to really sort of pioneer here. Uh, I've already mentioned that both but, but both this and the document sort of clear on this too, that, that, that this is both a, a, a sort of a plan uh, and has planning status in the alongside the MPPF, but also we have transport policy status as well. And it's that integration that matters and gives it weight uh, and makes it kind of legitimate for what comes what comes next. And then most importantly, I guess, and and for uh, for, for people to be aware of, not only will it kind of help guide 
uh, local planning authorities without sort of taking on the responsibility of local planning authorities, but it will also help guide uh, national departments and their agencies in terms of how they invest in infrastructure and other things to support the growth of this plan. It is a it is a government, it is a document of the government, not just the MHCLG, so it, it will have the signatories across all of the, uh, the ministries uh, and departments, and so it's really important to stress that this is a, a Whitehall plan. Um, developed with local partners in collaboration and, and we think that's really important to ensure that we actually then sort of deliver on the investment that will unlock our objectives around growth and our objectives on sustainability into the future. So I'll, I'll stop there and just 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 by finish by saying a thank you to everyone who's been involved in some of the great work that we've done with some of our local partners, uh, particularly the leaders of the local authorities and, and Bev who's on this call now uh, and others that have contributed to some of the work today. This is the start for us. It's the start of the journey. Uh, we want to take it take our next steps with you and work collaboratively over the coming two years to, to deliver what we hope is uh, the, the, the pinnacle of plan making at a regional level in this country um, and, and sets a kind of framework for what can happen next uh, for, for the growth of the ARC. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Chris. That was really interesting. Thank you very much indeed for that presentation. That was, that was fantastic to hear such good content in there. Um, just as a point of note, we will be sharing results of the polls as we go through, um, and I believe we're sharing one now of the first poll. So which element of the ARC vision should be given the highest priority? Placemaking, 23%, uh, jobs and growth, uh, the winner at 34%, uh, closely followed by infrastructure at 30%, and the environment at 12%, um, which I think is interesting and probably in line with with our expectation um thank you for that sharing that so um chris we've got a timeline for the end of 2022 to to release the full document um that's quicker than a local plan um which usually takes sort of four or five year pro um, timeline this this is going to cover 23 authorities and is this feasible and what do you need what resources are required outside your team, your current team in Whitehall to deliver this? Yeah, so it, it is very much quicker, um, but I, th I think the pace uh, recognises the, the appetite in Whitehall to make progress on this and make good on some of the promises that ministers have made in the past. So, so I think it's important to stress that. Um, I think in terms of the work that we're doing and the work that we do, I think we've got a specialist team that we've uh, built up to kind of lead some of this work. We've got multiple departments that will be contributing to the work that we do at, uh, at the sort of national level. Uh, and then, of course, we're, we're working really uh, closely with kind of colleagues in local government and the local planning authorities to help us kind of make sure that we're asking the right questions. We understand what's happening at a local level uh, through the local plan process. Um, and then we've got in place a kind of a, a way of collaborating through that. So, so that I, it's not just the kind of team of government sort of leads, but but actually there's a you know there's a whole ecosystem of people that can contribute to this uh, and will contribute over time. So so I think we have a really robust kind of uh, model for how we develop this. Um, it's exciting and, and look you know that the, the current planning process takes too long. And I think you know is is it fit for purpose in the 21st century? Probably not. Um, and so this kind of builds on the planning reforms that the that the Secretary of State launched last year, um, and, and sort of takes them to the next level. Level. But, but I think utilising the technology that we have, we already have a really good understanding of what's happening in the place and we have some great relationships with uh, the right planning authorities and the different interests across across the area. I think I think we're in a we're in a good spot and we and we need to make sure that we do it properly. And then and, and the one last point is that I think a lot of these stages run simultaneously uh, as, as we develop. So the evidence gathering we've sort of started, we've already kicked off our work on the sustainability appraisal and doing some of that benchmarking. We've worked really closely with DEFRA on natural capital and, and thinking about the sort of natural environment already. So a lot of the work is already un underway um, and we want to be able to present some of that and talk to people about it because I think, I think it's important. And we think there's enough time to do all of these things um, and, and we will make sure that we can deliver on, on this timeline. That, that, that's the promise we've made to, to ministers uh, and we think it's the it, it's what people locally uh, in the real world actually want they want to see progress now not tomorrow sure okay that's really interesting thank you um looking at, through the document we've read through um one i mean there are there are sort of key phrases that stand out and one of them stood out to me was in uh, 1.25 um, government playing a supporting role um 
so how does this what do you mean by government playing a supporting role as opposed to uh, say suggesting that government would lead um, or government would actually take control yeah i mean so it, it, it's a good question i mean firstly this is a government document so of course we we will be leading a a process and uh, and sort of publishing something at the end that is a government publication um when we say supporting i guess what we're talking about is how, how, how do we sort of make sure that we're not running away on our own but but kind of taking kind of everyone with us and so we want to make sure that we're giving people the opportunity to contribute and and, and support us and we see it as a collaboration we don't see this as as it just being a government uh, top-down sort of position this is very much kind of how do we create the right uh, architecture and interact with the right people to make sure that this is something that belongs to all of us um, um, and I think that, that that's kind of what, what I guess we'd say of, of course the document's also written in a way that it leaves a lot of uh, unanswered questions intentionally because we haven't come up with all of the answers and we want to do that in a way that engages with people so that they they too can give their view and we can kind of debate kind of the, the right approaches and the different ways in which we can deliver and do things Things. Uh, and we think that's important because if, if, if we come to the table with everything set up, uh, all our ducks in a row, and we just implement them one by one, that, that's not really a dialogue, it's not really conversation, and it's definitely not collaboration. So, so we think it's really important that that is understood. Um, and I, I should also say, just for the record, uh, uh, I probably won't know all the different kind of paragraphs <laughs> line by line, so yeah, I apologize. Fair. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, and uh, Bev, picking up on that, that collaboration point, Bev, um, the local leaders uh, you're representing the local authorities leps etc so there's a vast number of people that you're uh, representing across the arc um are they committed to this um are they willing to collaborate do they feel that it's taking power away from them that that, that they should retain uh, what so what's the feeling amongst the the people you represent thank you ian i mean first of all i represent most of the local authorities and most of the leps in in, in the arc um and i would say they're overwhelmingly supportive i mean I, i've just literally come from an ARC leadership executive meeting this morning where um, they were very complimentary of the work here. And we are very pleased to recognize a lot of the language that's in here. It's language we've been helping to develop and push and work with Chris's team over the last couple of years. But I do have to give compliments here. I think they've gone further than we thought they might have gone in terms of opening up that wider conversation about particularly around the environment and and and, and placing it with that that absolute importance alongside the, the economy. I think that's something we very much welcome. Uh, I think we also welcome the idea that there's going to be collaboration, not just with us as a collective group or as uh, with authorities, but indeed a legitimate attempt. And it's difficult. There's, there's 4 million people here, but a legitimate attempt to get down and make sure that individuals are heard. I think that's a big tall order, but, a, but an absolute right challenge that they should take on. I guess the last thing I'd say, Ian, it would be wrong for me to say, sure, there's some concerns or there's some cautiousness because this is new, this is different. Uh, change is not always welcomed by all of the constituents that I represent. They'll want to make sure that their local plans still have the place to be able to provide local input. Um, but I think we've got to be honest with ourselves. We were calling for it, most of us, for the fact that there was a big gap between local plans and national policy. And here's a perfect opportunity for us as a local system to help influence national policy. That's an unusual situation. This isn't just standard consultee stuff. We don't want to miss the opportunity to shape that. So I think we welcome it. I think like you and like most of the people in this audience, we're curious about some of the things and how they'll develop. But Chris has acknowledged those are things that they haven't predetermined and they're giving us the opportunity to help shape. And I don't think we could ask for any more at this particular point. Yeah, it seems to be very much a, a new approach to planning, certainly on a major scale, which is really, really good to see. Um, Robbie, um, from a technical point of view, um, how do you think the plan's going to be administered and what are the challenges uh, legally um, for this going through? Well, um, Ian, uh, good afternoon, um, uh, everybody. I, th I think that uh, uh, this this is an enormously refreshing uh, document. It really brings the issues to life. It doesn't read like a normal white or document, I have to say. Um, so uh, absolutely delighted, and I think it presents all sorts of opportunities for regional spatial planning, not just uh, in the arc, but actually elsewhere as well in England. Um, I mean, there are no, you know, the courts confirmed recently in the Friends of the Earth Challenge case, there are no uh, set legal or administrative processes that um, a national framework document like this has to go through, but there are certainly plenty of legal pitfalls. Um, and I, I think, the I mean, yeah, there are a lot, there, there can be lots of technical assessments required as the document um, recognises under the framework of the sustainability appraisal, so dealing with habitat, habitats issues properly, dealing with equalities issues uh, properly, which are referred to in, in, a, in, in, in the context of social issues. Um, and there are lots of potential 
pitfalls there where uh, legal challenges may arise. Um, but I think the real major pitfall um, is, is in relation to consulting effectively and lawfully. As Bev just mentioned, it is a tall order here to make sure that all individuals are heard. I very much welcome what the um, uh, policy paper is saying about this, but let's face it, a government is not used to and has not set up central government, that, that is, to um, consulting uh, on such a wide ranging uh, set of, of issues across such a wide area as the ARC. Um, I don't believe it's ever been done before by central government and therefore it's a huge challenge for um, uh, you know, Chris and his team to set themselves up and resource themselves and have the focus within government to actually do that properly because there's all sorts of um, uh, stuff from the courts in the last few years in terms of how you do consult properly uh, and it's a long process it's not an event um, and therefore there are there, there are big pitfalls there which um, I, I think could be overcome uh, but um, certainly with clear thought and resourcing um, and, and clear prioritization within Whitehall um, for a sustained period of time so um, there are no set rules um, but uh, the courts have been clear if you consult you've got to do it properly you've got to you've got to consult at the right time with the right information you've got to then conscientiously consider what people are saying back to you and it's different to engagement um, uh, but yeah there is a challenge for government it's not set up to do this sort of thing uh, it is a new way of working as we've been talking about and and, and I think um, that the, the risks will, will, will I'm sure Chris and his team have been thinking those through and you you can see some of them uh, being given some treatment already in the policy paper, but there's much more to, to, to be done on that. Sure. Okay, Chris, is there anything before I come to Jackie? Is there anything you want to, to respond to on those points raised by Robbie? No, I, I think I think Robbie kind of said it out really well. I, I think we're, we're conscious of the need to do this properly, and and we're we're kind of gearing ourselves up to do that. Um, you know, we have we have a range of people that can help us from a from a sort of legal perspective, and obviously have our own sort of teams as well as being able to draw on others who can help us. Uh, in in essence, you know, we need to do this properly. We have lots of experience, uh, not not of this type of thing, but but obviously of kind of major major schemes and infrastructure schemes that we can draw on. Um, but you know, this is going into new territory for us. Uh, we will we'll be making very sure that we're following the the, the the right guidance and doing things properly and appropriately uh, at the right time. And I think the other thing that I would I would add is that you know we want to make sure that you know when we talk about transformation in the art we also want to make sure that we're doing policy in the best possible way uh, and so we'll have to make sure that we kind of do this effectively otherwise you know we'll, we'll stop the progress that 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 that, that that we want to make and, and that isn't good for anybody so um you know i really welcome sort of robbie's points and and, and the note that they shared yesterday uh, and, and we'll definitely want to work with people to make sure that we do this properly okay thank you um, jackie just turning to you from a, a regeneration uh, point of view um what how do you think we can use the spatial framework as a platform for local economic recovery and growth well, I think it does give us a fantastic platform. I'm going to uh, nick, unashamedly, I'm going to nick the comments that Rachel Dickey of Grosvenor made yesterday in very luminous comments where she puts, um, a focus for development in the ARC must be on building trust with local people. The risk with regional strategies is that they leave individual communities without a voice. That needs to be addressed head on in these plans through a positive approach to engagement that aligns regional ambitions with priorities for individual communities, whether that's new homes, the regeneration of high streets, or a reimagining of our towns and cities. Now, I wish I'd said that. Um, notwithstanding everything that Chris and Rob, Robbie have just said, and thank God they're getting, you know, keeping us right technically and in terms of process, if we don't begin now to work with local communities on the ground in this, then we are going to lose the yeah. moment. Um, yeah. We really don't have the time. Now, my company, as you know, owns a large site in Biggleswey, a market town in central Bedfordshire. Um, and we are looking for, for, to bring forward a new settlement, a new garden community there. We're working very closely with the mayor of Biggleswey and with the leader of central Bedfordshire. We can't wait two and a half years for this plan to be in place. We have to forge a local economic recovery plan for Biggleswade now. 
uh, and we need that to be quite ambitious. Um, and if we can steady the ship and get Biggleswade to recover, then it can then take its place in the wider firmament of the arc. But actually, we have got a post-COVID situation here and a dirty Great Recession, and we are going to have to work together to grow ourselves out of poverty and unemployment. And I think that has to be a start. We have made a start in Biggleswade. Uh, you, you may know we... Um, Actually, Robbie's firm acted for us on it. Uh, we have a housing infrastructure fund uh, grant of 70 million to cover. Well, somebody noticed there wasn't any power in Biggles Wade at all. So, you know, we've got these fantastic plans for the Oxford Cambridge Arc, and actually, we've got a real problem with utilities. And I know that's been touched on uh, quite extensively. Uh, somebody noticed we hadn't got any power. So, we've now done this work on the HIF uh, to bring forward and future proof really East Bedfordshire. Uh, so that it's got the power to go forwards. Now, that's a good case study, a good practice there that we can share with other towns and cities throughout the arc. And I put on offer now a genuine offer of all the work that we've done in Biggleswade. I'm happy to share with whoever. There should be a local economic plan for Biggleswade. There should be one for Bedford. There should be one for Milton Keynes. There should be one. And we should be harnessing all the energy locally in order to start to work bottom up. And I think if we can do that and marry that up with a top down construct, which is taking the arc out onto a global market platform, then I think we may be really onto a winner. But I, I would ask you, you know, we've been five years waiting to get here. I, I don't want to whinge. You know, we've got here and it's a spatial framework. It's good enough, you know, it's a good enough platform. Keep us right technically and on the process, Chris, Robbie and others, right? But let us get on and start delivering, please. Sure. OK, that's that's great stuff and some real passion in there as well, Jackie. I can tell you that it's a, it, a lot of experience has got into uh, to, to, to coming up with that answer. Thank you. I might be old, but I tell you this, every scrap of what I've done, I'm bringing to bear to help Biggles Way to recover now. You know, it's town centre regeneration, it's new settlements, it's, it's a biodiversity strategy, it's an alternative transport strategy, it's everything. Chucking the kitchen yeah. sink at it, Ian. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, the government have got the high street task force and it's, you know, it's, it's bringing that in to make sure we regenerate our town centres as well. So I agree, it's, it's a really wide picture we're, we're looking at. Um, just bring, touching on one of those elements then, we've talked about utilities and, and leading to infrastructure because a, a large part of uh, the proposal has been, and we've got the results up now actually. Um, so this is what would be the best way for the spatial framework to encourage economic growth and prosperity. So really picking up on your point there, Jack, um 12 percent uh is for tax breaks um two percent is appointment of a business champion uh the winner is infrastructure at 48 percent uh and an investment channel um for local government strategies 14 and uh um the r d roadmap four percent so um and there's one underneath uh, but the, the, the winner is clearly infrastructure there. Um, the ARC Investment Fund, sorry, is the last one at 20%. Um, so picking up on the infrastructure, Robbie, I'm going to come to you on this um, with your experience. How Do we need more teeth in the ARC to, to, to pay for um, the infrastructure to, to really lead this? How, how do you feel the infrastructure is? Uh, um, and one for Chris as well. How are we going to fund that? And, and, and what's the delivery on that? How are we going to weave the delivery of the infrastructure into business and, and, and housing growth? Um, shall I go first, Ian? Yes, please do, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean as, as Chris has explained, this will, uh, you know, the spatial framework will provide a sort of blueprint for government investment uh, across Whitehall and its um, agencies. Um, so including, for example, clearly Department for Transport. Um, I, I think the special framework will be extremely helpful when it, when it comes to the nitty gritty, you know, the coalface of trying to get consent for these major schemes like East West Rail. So take East West Rail central section to Cambridge, uh, that will go through the development consent order process. Um, the work is underway uh, for that. Um, and the spatial framework will be a key, the key document, I suspect, um, sitting below the national networks, national policy statement that will provide the policy backdrop uh, and, and backbone for for that project and, and, the, and the key justification for it. So uh, as our uh, series of national policy statements for national infrastructure is getting older, uh, energy and uh, and transport and, and other uh, uh, sectors of infrastructure, um, these sort of spatial frameworks um, covering regions of England are going to be uh, absolutely invaluable. And um, so I, I think that um, and the, and the spatial framework will also 
uh, inform, um, as the document yesterday makes clear, uh, local transport plans produced by the local transport authorities. So uh, I, I think, you know, policy sounds a bit dry, but actually when it comes to, uh, as I say, the coalface of uh, the nitty-gritty of getting consent for individual transport projects, which have uh, significant impacts, obviously, and benefits, um, these policy documents are really important, um, and it's important to get them right um, uh, at this stage. And I think, you know, the collaboration that this document from yesterday is signalling and the work to be done in the next two and a half years of three stages of consultation, it's going to be hard work to keep that pace up, I think, um, uh, will really help, I think, to take the sting out of uh, these major projects when it comes to the actual consenting process. And hopefully a lot of the issues they give rise to would already have been, um, uh, if not resolved, certainly um, discussed and be on the way to resolution through the policy process. So I think, I think it'll really help uh, our, our day job of getting consent for these infrastructure schemes. Sure, okay. Chris, thanks. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think I mean Robbie touched on it really, really well, and so kind of uh, uh, th thanks, Robbie, for answering the question for me. Um, but in essence, it also helps us kind of plan for the longer term as to how we prioritise, because there'll be choices in all of this. Um, and you know, I think there's a question from Edward in the in the in the chat bar. Um, that, you know, this will have to have a kind of some say over kind of where the future kind of road connectivity and sort of rail connectivity will be for the long term and therefore we'll need to kind of you know weigh those up in in the context of what we think this the contribution that it can make to growth but also the kind of impact that it can have on the environment and we'll need to look at those elements as we go through this process and um, so, so, so i hope that what we're looking and planning for and, and what you'll see in sort of like the long term is this really kind of coherent way of prioritizing schemes, understanding kind of where they interact and bite, and then putting in place the kind of the right measures and therefore and the investment uh, and the timeline to actually kind of make them a reality rather than you know waiting for a national document and then bidding in for a set of things. Here we'll have a, a forward-leaning look as to what's required over the long term and, and not just on the kind of short time horizons that you know much of the decision are currently being made and then just finally on utilities i think what 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 we'll also have to do as part of the analysis is to really understand what some of the constraints are likely to be and to try and take a different view for that long term because because often the, some of the utility providers will tell us that some of the regulatory framework that they have to work within sort of constrains their ability to invest uh, a lot against the long-term kind of like um, demand challenge. And we'll need to kind of think about that. And that's both true for energy as, as much as it is for water. And everyone knows the kind of some of the challenges that we have uh, currently in Cambridgeshire around water. Uh, and, and I think what this kind of, what this document will both signal to, but also uh, help us achieve is, is a kind of plan for how we overcome some of those challenges and think about the solutions at the right time to make sure that we have uh, a way that can kind of build sensitively to the environment. Uh, and I think that that's really important. So, so I'm, I'm confident this is a this is us moving into a different direction. This is very different for for UK government, uh, and, and I hope people recognise that in, in, in what we've produced. Yeah, absolutely, thanks, Chris. Um, Rob, just turning to you quickly. Any is there anything missing there in the in the spatial framework that you've seen so far? And what what are the elements which you really like from a from a planner's point of view? Yeah, well, as as a strategic planner uh, through and through, uh, and I've been waiting a long time for this moment. Uh, and yesterday, when the document appeared, I read it. I read it upside down, inside out, and thought, "This is a really well-written document." So I've got to congratulate Chris and his colleagues mm. because it does make a lot of sense, and it's actually very clear and succinct for a planning document, which is great. It's not overly abbreviated with using lots of jargon either. But uh, yeah, I can't find much wrong with it. I mean, the questions you asked earlier, Ian, uh, the three questions—they were mine anyway from yesterday, and. Uh, I think Chris has answered them really well. Of course, we're early stages and this is about the process and it's an introduction to the process. I, mean, I always think of the four P's. Process, we've got a tick. Plan, that's the vision and that's coming uh, in the next few months and we're very looking forward to that. Policy, that's the governance question and that's where I think there could be a bit more questioning about it because it's not that clear how this is going to end up, uh, the strength and the weight of the document. I mean, your intent is very clear. Ranking it with the MPPF, you know, some of our guests might think, well, I can't use the word Bible because that would be disrespectful. But actually, it is our Bible. And it's, if it's going to rank with that, that's fantastic. And my last P, of course, is performance. 
And of course, that's in the delivery. So we can't talk about those things yet. So at the moment, I'm really happy uh, with it and I shall keep pressing for further improvement. Uh, you've done brilliantly and uh, you've sort of answered everything we've wanted in the last couple of years. Well, that's fantastic to hear. Thanks. That's a resounding thumbs up. So that's uh, that's great news. I'm just going to come to a, a, a couple of um, audience questions. And um, we've had one about uh, from Edward about um, local authorities and local plans. Um, so, I mean, for instance, Cambridge's local plan is due for adoption in 2024. Bedford Borough Council have just gone out for, have just finished their call for site. So there's a lot of activity around local plans within the arc and uh, maybe I turn to this um, to Bev actually for this one first is there a danger here that uh, local authorities will lack any incentive to get on with their local plans now and they'll just sit and wait for the spatial framework to be uh, finalized before they then work on their local plans and does that then leave us with two years of of, of little activity what's your feeling on that Bev? Uh, thanks Ian um, I think there is a concern but I wouldn't see it from a let's just down tools and wait to see what happens. I think there's a real concern from local authorities who are saying, hold on a second, I've got to comply with a document I don't even understand here yet. And I think that's the challenge. And, and I think Chris answered this question to our group as you would expect earlier this morning saying, well, there are lots of changes coming to national planning policy that local plans have to pick up. And that's a regular occurrence. I think the question for us though is how can we work closely with Chris's team to make sure that we are integrating those local plans in some collective but also it might require some individual solutions so we might need some transitional arrangements i think the paper does actually indeed talk about the fact that some transition arrangements may need to come out to be able to make sure we don't lose that momentum on existing local plans because that's also the very clear message don't stop what you're doing now we can't afford to slow down but there is a concern and we do it is something we have to manage but there's two things i want to pick up that i think are relevant to that Ian. one is look and i see some of the questions in the chat and it's not unusual um I don't think there's ever consensus about growth. And, and, and I'll just quote, paraphrase is probably a better term, the, the, the chairman of my group this morning saying, look, that's a tough, tall order to get consensus around growth. But what there is consensus on is when we do growth, it, we should do it well. And I think what this document starts to really pick up as Rob was saying, it starts to pick all the components that we recognize as doing development well. Um, there will always be arguments about how many. Um, my group considered it a success that, 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 that perhaps one of your membership, but I know one statement yesterday, was frustrated that it didn't say anything about a million homes. And of course, with my group, that's obviously a win. But it's not about the number, and not right now. The number is important and it will be, it'll be battled everywhere as we go through. The point is, let's move away from just a conversation about numbers and get quality. So if that's right, and it's quality of place, quality of space, quality of environment, etc., then I think local plans and local planning authorities can see the value of tying into this document. So there could be some going, look, actually, if I can just tag my policy development against this new policy framework, I might come up with a far better product. I might actually be able to unlock things my local council has wanted to do, but didn't feel it had the evidence base or didn't feel it had the national policy coverage to hang. So I think we've looked at the sort of cynical side, which is, well, people use this as an excuse. I think the other side is, but we might take a bit of time and actually take opportunity from this development. So I think that's what's going to be really important going forward. I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain there'll be local planning authorities being very mindful of how this impacts their local plans grow, as they should. But keeping contributing to it, helping to shape it, we've set up collaboration forums to work closely with Chris's team. We should be able to manage that as best we possibly can, like any national policy change that ultimately impacts local plans going forward. Thanks again. Excellent. Thanks, Bev. Chris, is there anything you want to add on that? No, just that we've made, we, what we've tried to do is build in a sort of as much process into uh, us publishing different different elements of the work at different stages so that people can see the journey that we're going on. And, and so that's important because as you're developing whatever plan you're doing at whatever level, it's really important that you're looking at the evidence that is coming around you and, and how it interacts with you. So I think for us making this kind of really open and doing it in that way, I think we'd also like to make sure that we're, 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 we're I guess, an offer to kind of local planning authorities through the process is that we want to make uh really clear that the evidence that we have and, and the evidence that we develop is a fit for purpose for us but also fit for purpose for you and and so it's really important that you interact with us we talk about some of the needs and then we create an evidence base that is across the arc that everyone can utilize and um, so that we don't have to go out and commission the same things 
over and over again. So, so we think there's a kind of there's some possibility there, and and, and then just that you know each each kind of place will be at a different stage in its plan making process, and and we're really clear that we need to carry on because you know there are some massive challenges that we have to overcome uh, around housing affordability. Um, we're not we're not kind of preparing and, and planning for growth effectively today, let alone kind of what we'll be doing tomorrow. So so we need to make sure that we're we're doing some of this work, and so we'll have kind of in, in, in you know individual conversations with planning authorities to understand where they are in the timeline, and also give them whatever supports necessary to make sure that we're not slipping back and waiting for the, this to be complete. Uh, and then finally, the, the pace that we're going on is so that we can get it done, and and, and therefore it will, it will exist, uh, and people will then have to kind of take it into account as 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 they go forward. And to Rob's point, you know, it's sitting alongside the MPPF. Uh, actually does give it quite considerable weight strategically um, and, and, I, and I think it adds so much value not just in terms of infrastructure projects that you bring forward but it gives more kind of context around the, the regional kind of growth that will come forward and the kind of challenges and uh, constraints to that growth um, that people can plan into their plans that m will make them better plans uh, irrespective and I think that's also important to kind of stress so I think this improves the whole process over time but there will be some kind of challenges in the short term because we haven't published something yet um, formally, um, but, but that, that's, that's what we're working towards. And that's why we're going to collaborate in, in the way that we've discussed. Sure. OK, I'm just going to touch on something slightly different here. Actually, that this is perfect timing. The, the, the poll um, of the latest results are out. Um, what should the key outcome for the ARC Spatial Framework be? Um, it, that it delivers sustainable economic growth across the area, 34%, creates a brilliant place, place to live, work and travel in, 47%, and 19% voting for delivering uh, lasting improvements to the environment, green infrastructure and biodiversity. So that's quite interesting because environment came uh, lowest of the first poll as well, um, yet creating a, a, a good place to live in terms of uh, sustainability has to have the, an environmental impact in there as well. Um, does anybody in the panel want to touch on the environment, environmental impact here? How are we going to create somewhere which is actually a sustainable environment for us to live and work in as well as a good place to live with, you know, with, with well-paid jobs? Ian, just if I can, I think there's a, a couple of things I wouldn't mind. I mean, I don't know. You never know with these polls if it's a dynamic of the audience, if it's a dynamic of our time. Look, recovery is foremost in our attention. The government's been very clear. This is an economically led significant region. So those have got to be at the forefront of the conversation. I think what we're trying to balance out here is, and, and, and I think the polls are interesting, but I don't think it has to be binary. I think that's the part the poll doesn't pick up is why can't you have a good economy and a good environment? And I think yeah. what the paper did yesterday, look, it's talking about identifying places for growth, but it's also talking about identifying places for nature and for environment. That's a different language than we've heard before. So I know some of the authorities that I'm working with who are really frustrated that they would like to achieve more environmental gain alongside a proactive view about development aren't actually able because they don't have the policy hooks and, and the ability through a viable assessment to be able to deliver that. Well, so I think that's our challenge. How can we have our cake and eat it too? And I think that's a reasonable aspiration. So I don't think these are binary decisions at all. I think the environment needs to also be believed. I think that's the other thing that I think Chris's paper starts off yesterday. Historically, we've just not seen enough on it in national policy to really believe it, but the work DEFRA has done, the 10-year plan, the 25-year plan, sorry, the 10-year, 10-point statement, these are things that all start to make us feel like, wait a second, we could actually have both. And, and by the way, why don't we throw in inclusivity and, and better social outcomes as well so we truly get sustainable development? I think that's what the paper talked about, and I welcome that. Sure. Okay, that's an excellent answer. Thank you for that. Um, Chris, does anyone want to, to bring in on that one? No, I just think it's a really good question from Nick Sanford in the in, in the Q and A that I think is just worth picking up on. I, I mean, we, we've been really deliberate in kind of what we've talked about in the document, um, because for us, we think it is important that we think about how we tackle some of those uh, environmental enhancements and how we can kind of really get put them alongside uh, the infrastructure that we need, you know, and, and, and give them the same relevance as kind of the, the sort of roads or rail that might come forward. So, so for us, it's quite important to do that. Um, we want to develop something over the next kind of two years that kind of 
put some sort of proper, uh, I guess, deliverables against some of that. And, and you know, whether they're targets or not, I don't know, because we need to make make those choices. Um, but but I think we we have to embed it as part of what what we do. And and there's a reason why we're talking about the environment. You know, I think it will change the way in which we invest in infrastructure in the future. The business cases will need to change because it's so important. Because we won't be able to to make uh, to make amends if we get this wrong. So so for us, it is really important. I think uh, I hope that the the work that the local leaders have been doing, and, and in particular Bridget. Smith uh, and Southcams, who has been leading the kind of charge on the green art, you know, they've developed some really great principles um, with kind of uh, interest groups across uh, across the environment sort of lobby. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's a really good start, starting point for how we think about and how we adapt uh, and include the, those principles as, as kind of whatever comes next as part of this framework. So um, I, I think it, it, there's a watching brief on this, but, but I really want to make sure that people have a voice in this, they really contribute to it, and, and we're so open to making this a, a reality, uh, which is very different to perhaps where we might have been three or four years ago. In, in the document, you talk about a levelling up agenda as well, and we, we've clearly got sort of Oxford and Cambridge as, as the dumbbells. Um, they're very, very successful already. Well, they've been in the news over the, the last year, clearly because of COVID and the, the life sciences, etc. So they're really successful. Milton Keynes sits in the middle and is the fastest growing city in the UK. <clears throat> what about the other places? How are we going to level up the Bedfords, Northampton, Corby, uh, Luton, etc.? How are we going to, to bring um, business and employment, sustainable employment into those centres? So, so, so I think, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's perfectly kind of placed to kind of do really well and, and yet it hasn't quite done as well as we might have done. So, so there are some areas that have just been left behind and some of that's because of the connectivity challenges. You, you can't kind of live and, and, and work in the arc and not notice the difficulty in doing east to west connectivity. You know, the fact that it, you know, it can take up to 45 minutes to get from uh, Milton Keynes to Cranfield is, is, is madness. And that's a kind of, a, 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 you know, a big, a big sort of institu uh, higher education institution. So that can't make sense. And um, so we need to do some more about how we connect up better, not necessarily Necessarily all the way from east to west, but actually in some of those urban centres, how do you connect to the kind of the, the, the rural hinterlands around them? And, and then what are the policies that we can produce that better connect businesses and the opportunities that spin out of the, the, the sort of um, the, the space constrained areas around Oxford and Cambridge uh, and sort of better connect those um, to, to kind of a parts of, of, of the arc? And that, that, you know, there's some really good examples of that happening, um, but, but we need to do more of that. And so we think by focusing on that central area uh, in the kind of coming years that we can really start to invest in sort of transforming some of those places and also putting in the right ecosystems so that they can they can benefit from the r d the innovation the jobs that are coming and and the jobs that will be kind of that will come once once the economy's uh, back on the uptick so, so there's there's more for us to do but we think the central areas is is the area where there's the most kind of the most short-term gains that could be made um, and, and that's where we need to focus lots of our effort Sure. Okay. Uh, just on a slightly sort of stepping back in a wider picture, there are some who are going to say and this is a really good question raised uh, by Roger in the uh, Q and A. Um, is the arcs already successful? Why do we need to focus more investment on the arc as opposed to other regions in the UK? Jackie, maybe that's one that you should, if you can take that first. The arc is successful, right? But you can't create a knowledge-based cluster in generations. And we have one here, okay? So this is not an either or. If we end up pitting the ARC against the Northern Powerhouse or against the Midlands Engine, then we will fail completely. This is a UK wide proposition. The ARC underpins the national recovery, right? And if we end up getting into the kind of tit for tat, you know, why the ARC, why not Manchester, why not Liverpool, then we will, we will be doomed. Uh, we really will fail. So please, we've got a, we've got a knowledge based corridor here. We've got a knowledge based cluster here. The best ever chance of getting, uh, as per the usual, the, the previous question, getting the, the likes of Bedford regenerated is through this this arc. Um, so please, let's not turn our back on what is a golden goose. Uh, it's taken, you know, it's taken us a long time to build this up, a millennium to build this up. Um, and we have it here. And we and it's a global product. So uh, please, let's not go for an either or situation. The other danger I think we have is getting swamped into some sort of vortex about how this spatial framework uh, represents a resurrection in, le in regional planning. Uh, if the planning anoraks get hold of all of this and start end endlessly debating all of that, we are doomed. I will say this, the market at this moment is incredibly titivated by the Oxford Cambridge arc. 
The market loves us, right? But it's taken us five years to get to here. We've got to get going. We've got to get going. There will be corridor fatigue. I am a renegade, as you said earlier on, for the Thames Gateway. I know how the market goes off these concepts. If they don't get populated quickly, we've got to get on and populate this and make it real. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, one question to all of you. Last one. We were going to um, then I'll ask you to just to have some wrap up um, comments. Um, we estimate there's about five billion of global capital chasing UK life sciences at the moment, um, but they're lacking an opportunity to invest. Are we going quickly enough with the delivery of the ARC? I mean, Ian, I think I think, I think our, our ministers' uh, uh, answer would be we're not. Uh, I, I mean, you know, it's if, if he, you know, if, if I, I mean, you should forgive me for saying this, but uh, I mean, ultimately, we, you know, it's taken us a, quite a long time to get to this stage. Uh, that's not really good enough. Now, there's lots of circumstances that have derived uh, uh, and rationale for why we've derived that derived at this position at this point. But, but ultimately, um, we need to be going quicker and faster. And, and, and the spatial framework is a starting point. But, but there are other things that we want to do in the short term that will really kind of help transform the economy, not least how we work with local places and help to kind of support them in their growth aspirations and to sort of build back better from the recovery uh, as part of the recovery. Um, but, but also kind of how, how we kind of utilize the, the growth body that we're kind of establishing establishing and, and, and look to, 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 to that to help us drive a different type of conversation at a different pace uh, that is both international but also arc wide and sort of interact better with the R&D innovation uh, and other things that are coming out of this kind of hugely successful kind of economy. So you say there's much more for us to do and um, I, I think you should be holding us more to account and, and, and I think um, at, at the minute you know um, I, I think I, I would say we're not doing enough. Okay. Anybody else want to, to come in on that? Uh, just quickly, and I think it's too simple a statement to say we're not going fast enough. I, I think we generally know we need to do this more, and we've been at this a long time, as, as Jackie said. I think what I'm really astounded by, though, is when we put our mind to it, somehow bizarrely, we can do things quite quickly. So when we have an emergency like a pandemic, we can suddenly actually develop a vaccine and produce it here in a very fast amount of time. And guess what? We can distribute it faster than anywhere else on the planet. So I'm not suggesting we have to have a pandemic to always get a, a, a bit of a fire behind us, but for, you know, we should create the circumstances. Why couldn't the framework or setting policies do that? That say space is important part of what we're doing here and how we resource ourselves going forward. I'm not saying create an emergency to drive. It shouldn't take that. But I do know there are real live examples of how we responded very quickly in the state of a crisis. So why don't we just take that as a more normal way of working? As long as we've got the right political measures, the right uh, legal measures, let's get on and try and make that forward. I think there's a challenge there, um, but I absolutely believe we, uh, we can do it. We've got the capability, we have the people, and we have the impetus, and we now have the narrative. So I think it's, it's for us to be able to do that. That's a fantastic uh, summary there. Rob, is there anything you'd like to, to add as a summary? I'm, I'm, I'm wary of, uh, sort of conscious of time. Um, we're very close to our allocated time slot. I'll just say that obviously I've picked up particularly on this levelling up uh, respect in, in the document and I think that the case that the universities group which Bev is linked to and Chris will know they could actually help sprinkle their magic dust uh, with the help of Oxford and Cambridge to actually spread the spread the joy a bit in, in commercialising R&D looking at these other towns uh, within the in the centre of the arc and actually then internationally will be globally recognised and there'll be more investment coming in. So I think that's a key point. Lovely. Thank you. Robbie? Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, clearly in terms of time scales, I take all those points and I think, you know, this must remain an absolute top priority in government. Um, uh, leadership is, is vital. We haven't really talked about the growth body, but I think that's a very uh, significant um, development too. And I think in terms of delivery, you know, clearly effective delivery structures are going to be important. And Chris's team are looking at up, you know, up to four new um, development corporations. Um, I think from my perspective um, and my background, I think you know, the devil really will be in the detail, as I was saying earlier, in terms of firstly, uh, lot, there are going to be lots of choices in terms of how consultation is undertaken and making sure that all concerned are consulted and engaged with, and, that, and that's a, a complex area. And secondly, in terms of all those technical assessments, environment, habitats, equalities, uh, all sorts of issues there in terms of scoping and methodology, where there are 
lots of lots of possibilities of getting it wrong and then and then, then getting into trouble legally in the courts and stuff which clearly we don't want to happen um given the, the need to get this up and over with by you know within the next two years or so so lots of lots of stuff there in terms of the detail which will need to be um thought through okay fantastic um jackie well, having ranted and raved a bit, and forgive me for that, I want to compliment Chris on having pulled together what is a very fine document and what obviously works across deep, across departmental, you know, right across Whitehall. I know how hard that is. It's a stocking achievement, so well done. And if you can continue to keep all the departments feet to the fire, that will be fantastic, really fantastic. But I also want to congratulate Bidwell's. Um, you've done the same job with the market. You've corralled us all to start speaking with one voice, and that is fantastic. Yep. Uh, the EG yesterday ran with a headline, New Arc Framework Will Supercharge UK's Economic Output. I think we need to start populating that. Uh, the market's ready to do it. It won't be ready forever, as I say. But if we can get if we can get in tow in the next two years, I really do think we could deliver something very fine here. Okay, that's fantastic, and thank you for the compliments there, Jackie. I appreciate that. Um, Chris, uh, I'll turn to you for the last um, roundup. Um, maybe just touch quickly on the art growth body as well. The board, at the who's going to be on that uh, art growth body um, as you do your summary. Yeah, so uh, th thanks everyone for sort of comments today and for, and for, for attending. I, I hope you see this as the kind of the start in us kind of doing a much richer set of engagement with you in consultation on the different stages as, as they develop. And, and and we do hope that everyone can kind of take the time to to contribute to the discussions. Um, in terms of the art growth body, th there'll be more coming in, in the not too distant future. Um, but but uh, and I think probably around the summertime, we'll say a bit in a bit more detail. But what we really want to make sure is that that, that body has the kind of the right uh, leadership. I think we will talk about some some sort of um, chair that has has the kind of gravitas to, to to fly over to Beijing and have the conversations that we may need and uh, to do that global kind of engagement as well as kind of corralling us and holding kind of the Whitehall kind of uh, feet to the fire to make sure we're making the right investments that kind of really make this place grow. And um, but it will also need to kind of con have con contributions from local kind of politicians and leaders to make sure that we're still connected to the place in a way uh, that is kind of meaningful and worthwhile and it will kind of draw on a lot of the talent that's already in the area and, and i think it would be unfair for us not to appoint somebody who is who is who is from the area and has lived in the area and contribute to the area's economy because i think that's also important um and, and then and then just to finish um just just a kind of thanks to, to bidwells for hosting for today and, and also my team who have done like an excellent job in bringing forward uh what, what what i think is genuinely a different sort of paper from whitehall it's 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 actually quite a good read quite a few people have told me it's actually quite interesting and are not written in the way that you would normally expect um, and, and, and I hope that people kind of come with us on this journey this is a this is a different approach uh, it only works if everyone contributes um, and, and we have to contribute in the right way in an open and transparent way um, and we'll say if things aren't working for us and, and, and there are different ways of doing things but, but we want we want to do this collaboratively and uh, please join us this is this is as much for you as it is as it is for us sure Thank you, Chris. That's excellent. Um, I'd like to round up by saying, firstly, thank you very much to all the audience for attending and, and being very, very engaged. We've had um, some really interesting questions, a lot of questions that we could have spent another couple of hours discussing. But time has, uh, has passed us by. We will get round to answering those questions um, after the webinar is finished. So thank you very much to the audience. Um, I agree with the comments on the document. I think it's a really interesting document. It's very different to what we've seen before and makes it for a very exciting future for us. So we really look forward to engaging with you and working on that as well. And lastly, thank you very much indeed to the panel. You've been excellent today. Some really interesting comments you've all given. Um, Jackie, Bev, Robbie, Rob, and of course, Chris, thank you very much indeed for today, for your time and expertise. It's been uh, gratefully received uh, by us all. Thank you very much. <laughs>